Hi everyone, welcome back to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Conservation Connect, where we connect you to conservation careers, wildlife species, and new technology we use to study and protect wildlife. We're coming to you from the National Conservation Training Center, and today we have some very special treats for you. I'm Chelsea McKinney, and I'd like to introduce some of our co-hosts that we have joining us. We have Brianna from Charlestown Middle School, and we have Jordan from Harpers Ferry Middle School. Thank you guys. That's right, Chelsea. And today we are celebrating Earth Day. Earth Day is intended to raise awareness about all kinds of environmental issues and problems, and to inspire people to take personal actions to change them. The theme for this year's celebration is sustainability not a trend, a tradition. That's so true, Jordan, and it's important now more than ever that we carry out sustainable practices or lifestyles, which means we need practices that will be long-lasting, such as conserving energy, recycling, and even eating locally. And even though there are still so many environmental issues we must address, why don't we first celebrate our success? And one of the biggest success stories are the American bald eagles. Back in 1970, long before you guys were even born yet, when we had our very first Earth Day celebration, bald eagles were in really big trouble. Their numbers were declining and they were put on the endangered species list in 1973. Now, thanks to the hard work of many dedicated conservation organizations, we have sustainable populations of bald eagles in so many parts of the country. Today, we're going to learn about the biology, the history, and the behavior of these animals. And later on, we'll be taking an electronic field trip to observe eagle nests in the wild. And joining us to celebrate the bald eagle's success, we have park rangers Jessica Conley and Ashley Ranke from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources at Tuckahoe State Park. Jessica, Ashley, and their co-worker, Bald Eagle, are with the Scales and Tails educational program for schools. Thank you, Chelsea. How many of you have seen a bald eagle in the wild? Most of you here today, that's excellent. Because when I was a kid, I would go years without seeing bald eagles. And my parents would point out every bald eagle that we saw. And I still do that today to my own kids. My own, own kids kind of roll their eyes. Yeah, mom, we saw one yesterday because there's so many around us. As Chelsea said, my name is Ranger Jessica Conley and I work for the Maryland Park Service and with me today is Ranger Ashley Ranke. And being a park ranger, scales and tails is one very small part of our job, but it's also our favorite part because we get to introduce you all to some of our native wildlife. Can anyone tell me what I mean by native? Anybody? Yeah. Like wildlife that lives around here? They all live around here, maybe even in your own backyard, but maybe you haven't seen them up close before. And Ashley and I brought with us a bald eagle today from our Scales and Tails program. All of the animals we use are non-releasable. That means they've all had something happen to them, and for one reason or another, they can't go back into the wild. Would I ever want to keep a wild animal in a cage that doesn't need to be in a cage? No. And we'll talk about the story of how this eagle came into our care a little bit later. So today, bald eagles are flying free and abundantly thanks to many conservation efforts. But they faced a lot of threats. In the earliest 20th century, their numbers were declining drastically. When I say declining drastically, there were less than 480 nesting pairs in the entire country. That's very, very few. And there were a number of reasons leading to their decline. One was fear. People were shooting them out of fear or poaching them and killing them because they thought that the eagles were competing with them for fish or they were trying to protect their livestock. So people would shoot them. Some bald eagles were poisoned from lead shot. Um, when the hunters would shoot an animal, sometimes the eagles would ingest the lead shot and they would be poisoned. And then the final um, reason that was leading to their decline was a chemical called DDT. And I'm going to turn it over to Ranger Ashley Ranke now, and she's going to talk to you guys some more about DDT and how that affected bald eagle populations. Okay, just as Ranger Jessica said, one of the things that has hurt our eagles in the past is DDT. Now, does anybody know what DDT is? 
pesticide. A pesticide, excellent. So if it's a pesticide, what does that mean it does? It kills bugs. It kills like bugs, right. Mosquitoes. Like mosquitoes, excellent. So during World War II, we were using DDT to kill mosquitoes. Now, what type of, what disease were mosquitoes known to carry? Malaria. Malaria. Excellent. Excellent. So during World War II, we were using we were using DDT to try to keep the population of mosquitoes down, and this was helping people from catching malaria. So it was good during the war. Now, when we came back and the war was over, we thought, well, this is excellent. It's killing mosquitoes. Farmers were like, this will be great. My crops won't be affected by so many pests, so many bugs. I'm going to spray it all over my farm fields, and that'll help my crops stay nice and healthy. But let's think about that for a second. When it rains, if we have something sprayed all over our crops or our lawn, what happens when it rains? Where does that, where would that DDT go? It would go into the ground and the rivers. Into the ground, into the water, perfect. So if it rained, the DDT was being washed off the land and it would go into our streams and our rivers, end up in the bay and eventually the ocean. Now, why would that be a problem? What types of things like to live in the water? Fishes. Fish, what else? Beavers. Okay, they would live in it, excellent. Turtles. Turtles. Otter. Yeah, they live in the water as well. So we've got little things like crabs, and fish, and turtles that live in the water, but then we have all the other things that live near the water or in the water, like beaver and otter and osprey and eagle, all that stuff. Now, eagles love to eat fish. A baby eagle, 75% of its diet is fish. That's a lot of fish, right? And so if they're living near the water and they're catching fish that have been living in water that has DDT in it, the fish probably absorbs some of that, that DDT, right? So what do you think would happen to the bird if it eats a fish that's sick? It might get sick. Right, it gets sick. If we eat something that's bad or rotten, we probably get a little sick too, don't we? Yeah. So that's what was happening. The fish were getting sick and all the animals like the bald eagle that was eating the sick things in the water, the fish, it was getting sick. And at first we couldn't figure out exactly what it was doing to the birds. But after some studies, we figured out that DDT was affecting the way that birds, the birds could metabolize calcium. Now let's think for a second. Why is calcium so important to birds? It hardens their eggshells. Yeah, it, it uses, it uses um, their eggshells use the calcium to be nice and strong. Exactly, because what does, if an egg's in a nest, what is the mother usually doing to it? Sitting on it. Sitting on top of it, keeping warm. And we were finding that the eggshells were so thin that just the birds sitting on it, they would crush. And so that was really, really lowering the population of our eagles. So we're gonna do a fun little activity and we're gonna use just our average chicken egg and we're gonna see just how strong these eggs are supposed to be. So I have a chicken egg here and I want you you're going to examine this egg. Tell me if there's any cracks. Does it look hard boiled? Anything like that. I'm not trying to cheat. No. Looks good? Okay. Yep. What we're going to do, I've got our contraption here and I've got my crushing helpers and they are going to, one at a time, we're going to put some weight on this egg and see how many pounds it can crush. Before we do that, I think we should guess. Don't you think we should guess? How many pounds of weight do you think a chicken egg can hold? What do you think? Like 15 pounds. 15 yeah. pounds? Yeah. 15 pounds? Okay. Yeah. 10 pounds? Uh, 20. 20. 18.2. 18.2. We're getting exact. How about we guess? 25. 25? 5. 5? 13. 13. You're the only one who didn't guess. Do you have a guess? 26. 26. Okay, so we've got some really good guesses. We're going to see who is closest. Now, you guys are going to help me with the crushing. I need one of you guys to help with my calculations. How about you? And so before we put the eggs on, we're going to yell out how much each rock weighs. We're going to keep a running total. I'm going to keep one as well, so we've got backups. Now, as I'm getting this set up, you'll notice there's a couple things inside of our contraption here. I've got some, some padding. Let's think for a second. So we're trying to make this seem as realistic as possible. And when a bird is sitting on an egg, what might this padding represent? 
the bird sitting on top of it. So we've got some on the top. That's the birds. It's fluffy feathers on top. What might the bottom be? The nest. The nest. Excellent. So I'm going to set the egg in here on our soft little nest. And I'm going to put the bird's feathers on the top. And we're going to put our contraption on top. So now we've got to add this weight. Is my calculator ready? Mm -hmm. This weighs 4.88. So let's get that ready, and I'm going to set this on. So our egg's doing good with 4.88. Now this is what we're going to put our rocks in, 2.71. So we'll add that. Now for my egg crushers. It's important when you are picking your rock up and you come around to the back and you're going to gently set it in there. We're not going to drop it. We'll gently set it in. And as we're putting rocks in, let's try to evenly space them out in there so that it doesn't tip at all, so we can get as much weight as possible on here. I am also going to keep a tally here on my calculator. So we had what, 4.88 yeah. plus 2.71? So we are already at, what are we already at? 7.59. 7.59 we're already at. Okay, so let's go ahead. We'll grab our first rock, any rock you'd like, and walk around to the back of the table. And before you put it in, read us your weight nice and loud. 6.57. 6.57. Gently set that in there. Excellent. We can keep going. Pick any rock you'd like. And walk around to the back of the table. What's your weight? 4.26. Excellent. So before you put yours on, let's give everyone a total. What do you have? 18.42. 18.42 we're already up to. Okay, what do you have? 4.40. 4.40. Excellent. Let's get another rock. Hasn't broken yet. What's your weight? 6.31. 6.31. Not broken yet. What's our total before we put our next one on? 29.13. 29.13. All right, when you put yours on, how about you, you want to put it in this back corner here? Okay. What is your weight? 3.29. Excellent. Looks like we're going to need another rock. Okay. <laughs> Choose wisely. <laughs> okay, read your weight nice and loud. 2.73. Still good. What are we up to? 35.15. 35.15. What's your weight? 2.77. Oh, what are we up to now? 37.92. 37.92. You going to go for it? Yep. Okay. <laughs> We've got the big rock. 9.08. 9.08. Gently set that on there. <laughs> what did that take us up to? 47. 47 pounds, and we still haven't broken our chicken egg. 1.34. 1.34. What's their next one? 3.19. Maybe in the back corner here. Excellent. Okay, what did that take us up to? 51.53. 51.53 our chicken egg is holding. What do you have? 1.91. 1.91. Good. I said 50. I changed my answer to 73. <laughs> <laughs> We're changing our answer. answer. Yeah, What's your weight? I say 3.19. I say, I say, maybe how about the back corner? 80. I say 80. I think it's going to be able to carry all these. What are we at? 56.63. 56.63. I, 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 what do we have next? 3.52. 3.52. I'm, I'm saying 60 on this one. Oh, yep, there right. we go. That rock broke us, and that rock would have taken us to 60. 
point one five. I said six. I said six. I said six. It didn't explode. Very good. So, so we can see we can see just a chicken egg was able to hold almost sixty pounds. Now, how much do we think a chicken weighs? Not sixty pounds, right? So eggs are meant to be very, very, very strong. And so DDT was making those eggshells so thin that even the couple pounds that a bird would weigh was breaking the eggs. They weren't as strong as they were supposed to be. And the and DDT was banned in the 70s, which uh, was right around the time that the Endangered Species Act was put into place and the bald eagle was put on it. So it was able to come back. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ranger Jessica and we're gonna talk about the anatomy and the importance of bald eagles. All right, so Ranger Ashley has talked to you guys about some of the threats facing the bald eagle, including DDT, and how we came together as a country and we enacted laws. So beginning in 1940, we passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act. That meant we could no longer shoot or harm bald eagles or their nest. And then Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, drew attention to the fact that DDT was harming our waterways. So in the 1970s, we banned DDT and we created the Endangered Species Act and we put the bald eagle on it. And through all of these conservation efforts, the bald eagle made a huge comeback. And today we see them all over. So now let's talk about what makes our bald eagle so special and so well adapted to live right here in the United States. But first of all, bald eagles are the only eagle native just to North America. They're not found in any other part of the world. So I think that was a pretty good choice for our national symbol. And let's take a look at our eagle kind of from head to toe. If we take a look, the bald eagle with me today has a beautiful white head, but they're not born that way. They change over time. When a baby eaglet is born, he's all fluffy and white and kind of ugly looking to be honest with you. But over time, he grows brown feathers that look similar to this. They might have flecks of white in them, but his whole body is brown, including his head. But once he gets to be about four or five years old, his eye color is gonna turn yellow and his head will turn white. This is gonna signify to other bald eagles that they're mature and ready to find a mate and they will mate for life. And when they find their mate, then they'll build their nest and return to that nest every year to raise their young. So that white head's really a symbol to the other eagles that they're ready to find their mate. Then we look down at those eyes. Are those eyes pretty piercing looking? Yeah, they have very intense eyes. Their eyesight is three to four times better than ours. This means they can see another bald eagle soaring in the sky from 50 miles away. Can you imagine? And not only do they have eyesight that can see other bald eagles soaring from far away? They can look down in the water and see a fish swimming in the river. Can we see fish swimming in the water very well? No, and can you imagine being able to soar from really high up in the sky and swoop down and grab those fish? So they have amazing eyesight. And then we get to that beak, that huge yellow beak. And all raptors or birds of prey have curved, sharp beaks like this, and this lets them tear apart their food. But not only is his beak sharp on the end, on that point, but the edges or the sides are very sharp, almost like a razor blade. Because bald eagles, in addition to eating fish, what else are they feeding on? Has anyone ever seen them eating something dead, like a deer carcass or something? Yeah, bald eagles will eat carrion or dead stuff. And a, bald, and a deer hide is probably pretty thick, don't you think? Yep, so they're gonna use their beaks to help tear into their food. Then we go down their body and look at their feathers. Their feathers are nice and smooth and stiff and they're gonna use these feathers to help them fly. And we're gonna pass out some feathers right now for you guys to touch and feel how smooth these feathers are and how strong they are. Now, Ranger Ashley is gonna pass them around and we've kept a count of our feathers today because the Bald Eagle Protection Act also makes it illegal for you to possess an eagle feather. So we have to make sure we get them back at the end. When you look at them, you also have to know that they act like a rain jacket for the eagle because eagles will live in very cold, wet climates um, all over the country, especially in places like Alaska. 
so it's going to keep their body really warm and well insulated. Where does he not have feathers on his body though? What's easy for you guys up front to see that's absent of feathers? Yeah. On his legs, right? His legs and feet are naked. Yeah, he has bare legs because if he's eating something old and nasty, does he want to get all that grossness on his legs? No, it's going to help keep him clean. And as he dives down into the water to grab fish, it's going to help keep him from getting waterlogged. And then we get down to their powerful legs with sharp talons. And this is going to help him when he goes hunting as well. His wingspan is about six and a half, seven feet. So longer than I am tall. The largest bald eagle wingspan on record was almost eight feet. So they have a huge wingspan. So he has all these amazing, amazing adaptations that help him survive in the wild. All right, well, you guys were a great audience today, and I thank you so much for inviting us here. And remember, as you celebrate Earth Day, to spread the word to your friends and family that we can all make a difference and have a sustainable future. So thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Ashley and Jessica, for doing that awesome science, technology, engineering, and math or STEM activity with us, bringing in your Scales and Tails Rehab Eagle and helping us learn the importance of keeping our environment clean. And thank you so much to our two awesome co-hosts, Brianne and Jordan, for assisting me today. You guys were awesome. How cool is it to have a real bald eagle here? But not everyone can have an eagle in their classroom. However, you can observe firsthand the fascinating lives of bald eagles by going online to view wildlife webcams and watching their behavior in a natural environment. Why don't we take a look at some wild bald eagles and their eaglets? Now some of these nests may be even close to where you guys live. Here in West Virginia, we have our NCTC Eagle Cam. We had two eggs hatch on March 28th and 29th. A third egg didn't hatch, possibly because of the cold and wet weather we had during the incubation process. Our camera angle is not exactly where we'd like it to be, but we don't want to disturb the eagles, so we must wait until they leave the nest, or we call that fledging, before we adjust the camera. This has been a very productive nest. It's located about 75 miles from Washington, D.C. on the campus of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center. The campus is just outside Shepherdstown, West Virginia and very close to the Potomac River. The nest has been active for nine seasons, fledging many juvenile bald eagles. A large international community of viewers enjoy watching the eagles raise their young every single nesting season. Now let's take a look at a new eagle cam in Pennsylvania that's produced with the help of the Pennsylvania Game Commission, Audubon Society, and some other partners. Now this pair of eagles are nesting within five miles of Pittsburgh along the Monongahela River. This is truly an Earth Day success story because only about 40 years ago, not many fish could be found in this section of the river. Bald eagles depend on nesting near clean rivers and waterways so they can find fish to eat and feed their young. But because great efforts were made to clean the waterways over the past 30 years, now over 75 species of fish are found there in more than 250 nests across Pennsylvania. That's nature's way of recognizing that we're cleaning up our act. That's incredible. Just about a week ago, the last egg hatched which totals three bald eaglets for this particular nest. As you guys can see, it looks like the eaglets have been eating pretty well, and it looks like the adult eagle is feeding them right now. Maybe your class could watch to see how many times the chicks get fed, or how many times the male and female will switch roles, where one is hunting while the other is keeping the chicks warm. What other observations can you make? We all know these are wild animals. Never before have scientists, the public, and students like you been able to observe wild animals this close and personal. Many new technologies allow us to better study and understand all types of wildlife. But because we can see so much now more than ever, we sometimes forget that these are wild animals. And not all wild animals are successful with nesting, establishing a brood, and finding enough food to survive. Nests can fail for many reasons, and this is just part of the natural world. 
Let's take a look at a slightly younger pair of eaglets. This nest is located on Jordan Lake near Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina. The camera was set up by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and eggs hatched on April 7th and 9th. Notice these eaglets still have their white color. Now let's take a look at an older eaglet, the Berry College Eagle Cam in Northwest Georgia. Two eggs were laid and one eaglet hatched on February 22nd. If you guys take a look at him, he's pretty big and actually has his blood feathers coming in. So even though mom and dad might be around the area, he doesn't need so much protection and so much warmth because he has those feathers. It's amazing to see how fast these animals can grow, especially birds, only 12 weeks from hatch to fletch. Now let's head west to visit the Decorah Eagle Cam in Decorah, Iowa. Here, there are actually three eaglets that hatched in early April. This nest is in a cottonwood tree on private property near the Decorah Fish Hatchery, which is operated by the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. It looks like this guy was really smart when he picked this nest. Along the banks of Trout Run in northwest Iowa, these eaglets have had a prime waterfront location. As we have seen in other states, bald eagle populations are on the rebound here, helped by a 1972 U.S. ban on DDT use, habitat improvements through the Federal Clean Water and Clean Air Acts, protection under the Endangered Species Act, greater public awareness, and restoration of local populations through bald eagle release programs. Although still protected by federal and state law, eagles were taken off the federal list as a threatened species in 2007. A true conservation success story for our national symbol. Well, our time is up for today. We hope you enjoyed our electronic field trip into the treetops. And thanks again to Jessica and Ashley and their eagle from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and to our student guest today. If you'd like to learn more about the bald eagles, check out this great new book by Tina Goro and Craig Kopey. It's titled Inside a Bald Eagle's Nest, a photographic journey through the American bald eagle nesting season. The book details the stories and photographs of wildlife biologist Craig Kopey and his work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on bald eagle recovery. We have many more educational resources, links to lesson plans and the webcams that we looked at today right on the Conservation Connect website. You'll also find a list of national wildlife refuges across the country that your family can visit to see bald eagles and many more wildlife species in their natural habitat. Take some time to make your own observations. Take good notes and maybe volunteer at your local conservation organization. But most importantly, get outside and enjoy springtime. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Conservation Connect.